Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and we're going to read all the way to 23. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream... Not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, other than just it's always a good idea to spend a good portion of time in the gospel of God, I think I read all of that so that we might see all of the supernatural conversation that was going on. We see this mix of conversation from God to his people. We see where he spoke to them through the written word, and we see where he spoke to them through dreams, and we see where he spoke to them through the wisdom of others. Sometimes I find myself just asking God for something, asking God for wisdom, and then I'm only waiting for him to speak directly to me and I'm not looking to the sources or the channels or the streams that he has ordained as voices into my life. I sometimes just always want to hear only from him and I neglect all the other places where God would speak to me. And spirit-filled people, we are like sometimes the worst about this. Because we feel like because we've been filled with the Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, or because we believe that the gifts of the Spirit are still in manifestation, we think they're all in manifestation to us. Not to someone or to us through someone. We think it's always like directly to us. But isn't that sort of the the beauty of the Christmas story? Is that the Word became flesh. That the word from heaven became flesh through the virgin girl named Mary. Now there were a lot of people who were not looking to someone like Mary to receive the Son of God. 
So because she was discounted, we actually discounted the word of God that became flesh and was born through her womb. And we many times can reject wisdom because we're not listening for someone through whom God has ordained wisdom to come from. We've decided God can only speak here or God can only speak there. And when God speaks from this place, all of a sudden we push back because we are not open. If we would find ourselves understanding the voice of God, we wouldn't be so picky about where the voice comes from. Because what we would recognize is his voice and it wouldn't matter the channel through which he chooses to speak through. When Mary found out through a dream that she was to be the mother of God, it said that she went to Elizabeth. She went to receive counsel from someone whom the Lord said, guess what? She received a miracle also. So if Mary was having any kind of doubt about what it was that God would do through her, God said, you go back and you talk to Elizabeth because she, guess what? She received a miracle because in her old age and in her husband's old age, they have become pregnant. So Mary went and spent three months with Elizabeth, someone whom people had discounted that God could ever send a child through her because of her age. God just shows off all by himself sometimes. Sometimes we find ourselves in a place where God made a promise, but it's been a little while, and so we just kind of neglect the promise. We forget the promise. You better wake that promise up. God connected Mary to Elizabeth that Elizabeth, her story, might inspire the life of Mary. God connects us with streams of wisdom that he desires to flow into us that we might know what it is that we are supposed to do and not only know what we are supposed to do but have the encouragement along the way. Please understand, Mary already said to the angel, be it unto me according to your word. She'd already been overwhelmed, overshadowed by the Spirit of God. God didn't send her to Elizabeth so that she could have faith for what God would do. He sent her to Elizabeth so that she could be encouraged in the process because sometimes what God has planted inside of you needs to be encouraged by someone else whom God has done something for. We need to quit spending all our time with people who discourage and disrupt our dreams and go find ourselves some people who believe like we believe who will stir up the gift that's in us. And so these wise men were sent to Jerusalem to worship the king. Now it begs the question, if no one in Jerusalem was looking for the king, how did wise men so far away know what was going on? What's sad is they had the same information that all of God's people had. It's just that they had faith and God's people surrounding Bethlehem didn't have any. So let's see how these people far east, let's see how they actually received this word that they might have faith to know that a king had been born. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 27, there is this moment where it says that Jesus explained to them, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus was prophesied back in Genesis and in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and then in all of the prophets as well. And he showed them all of these different places where it was prophesied who he would be and how he would come. And so there was a prophecy in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17 given by a man named Balaam. And he said he saw this from God. He said, I see him, but 
Not now. You know, sometimes God will give you a vision, but it's not for now. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a ruler shall rise out of Israel. So Balaam knew that it wasn't going to be any time soon, but there would be a time in the future where a star would be seen, and when that star was seen, then that would be a sign or a mark that the king was in Israel. Now, they didn't know the fullness of what that meant. They just had a sense of what that meant. There's not a timeline on that. Balaam just said it's far and it's not now. So keep in mind that that was thousands of years prior to Jesus Christ being born. And these wise men had been standing on this promise for generations. But again, how did the gospel that was prophesied in the time of Moses to God's children as they wandered around in the wilderness, how did that promise find its way all the way east? It said the wise men were from Babylon and from Persia and from Arabia. How did it get all the way over there? This Balaam was not a prophet of the children of God. He was just called a seer. And God simply opened his eyes to what was going to be seen. And he continued to tell his people and his students what he had seen. And then they actually received context for what Balaam was saying much, much later when the children of Israel were deported from their home all the way over to Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar and then under Cyrus who was leading Persia. So God's prophets and his wise men were deported from their homeland all the way to this place where the wise men would later come from. And this prophecy that Balaam had taught that the people who were the wise people on the east side of things understood fully they received context then from God's people when God's people were deported for Daniel who was one of the wise men of God's people prophesied in Babylon and in Daniel chapter 9 he said there would come a time when the walls of Jerusalem would be built back up and then it would be 483 years later when sin would actually be removed and so there was a timeline that was put in place. And so when God's people left Babylon and Persia and they found their way back, the wisdom that they had left continued to be meditated on in Babylon and Persia and Arabia. And these wise men would spend generations considering the words of God that had been left with them. Now, it still blows my mind that they counted these things more holy than the people whom God spoke them for. May the world never rejoice louder over what God is doing than the church. And if you're just curious if the numbers line up, some of you enjoy numbers, let me just kind of throw this as a sidebar. We see that John the Baptist... Um, that Tiberius began to rule in 14 AD. And it said John the Baptist began his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius. That means John the Baptist began his ministry in 29 AD. Don't forget John the Baptist was the child who was filled with the Spirit of God in his mother's womb when Mary walked in to see Elizabeth with Jesus in her womb. So this John the Baptist, 
He was a similar age to Jesus. He began his ministry just before Jesus in 29 AD, which means Jesus began his ministry late 29, early 30 AD. We also see very specifically through the Gospels that Jesus celebrated three Passovers during his ministry. That takes us up to 33, 34 AD. It's also very interesting that we know beyond fact that Jesus was crucified on the Passover, but he was also crucified on a Friday. That means that when he was crucified on a Friday, that had to be when the Passover was on a Friday because sometimes Passover was on a different day. At the time from 29 to 34 AD that we see there being one Passover that was on a Friday, that's April 3rd, 33 AD, which all falls in the timeline. And if we go do the math really nicely and account for the fact that their years were 360 days rather than 365, and we go ahead and deduct from that 33 April 3rd AD and we back up 483 years, we find ourselves landing right on 444 BC when the walls of Jerusalem were being built. What that means is the word of God proved true. What it also means is these wise men would have known the season that they began looking for the star to appear, though they didn't know the day, they didn't know the exact location, they knew the season. There are some of us, we better remember the season that we're living in, and we may not know the day, and we may not know the hour, but that doesn't mean our excitement should be tempered, but because we know the season, we better be looking. So the wise men were looking because of the prophecies that had predicted that the ruler would be seen when the star appeared. And they knew the ruler would be a ruler in Israel, so they left where they were and they traveled to Jerusalem to worship. But see this, when they found their way to Jerusalem, they were expecting everyone else who gave them these prophecies to know what was going on. And what they found when they got there was a sleeping church not paying attention to what God was doing. They said, where's the king? What king? The king. We saw his star. Where's the king supposed to be born? Herod didn't know. So he went and talked to the priest. The priest, by the way, who weren't looking for the star. The priest, by the way, who didn't go to Bethlehem. The priest, where, where is this supposed to happen? They said, well, the king, the Messiah, the son of God will be born in Bethlehem, Because Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 says, For you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the tribes of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. So they knew the word. They had the word. It's just that the word that they had created no expectation. I just want to remind you, that we will not receive a miracle if we aren't expecting a miracle. If we no longer expect God to move, it's not that God won't move, we just won't see it. It's not that God's not working, we just won't experience it. Why? Because we're not looking for him. Jesus was born whether the priests were looking for him or not, but they did not experience the glory of his presence because they didn't believe. What they knew didn't create expectation. What is it that we're expecting? What is it that we're looking for? What do we want out of this life? Like, like what's the point? A few years ago, I was in this um, sweet hotel. It's called the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs. And it was a couple days after Christmas. Me and my wife and my kids, we went there to just go hang out and kind of just, I don't know, recharge before the new year. And in that super, super nice place, we got checked in, I go wandering around, I'm just looking at all the stuff. And I step outside and there's this lake and it's, it's, there are fountains that keep the lake from freezing. 
because everybody that was there would have no desire to see a frozen lake, and I'm just impressed. Like, I'm impressed with all of it. The Rocky Mountains are in the background. There's Christmas trees all lit up all over the place. It was breathtaking. It was extravagant. It was amazing. The, the Rolex on the guy next to me was amazing. I'm like, covering up my watch. Like, it was, it was everything that people focus on and pursue. And there I am standing in the middle of all of this and I'm just staring into the Rockies in awe of the economics and the nature of it all. And I believe that I heard the whisper of God ask me a question. And he said, does this glitter more than the glory? (laughs) And I pushed away from that handrail in just utter fallen humility, thinking, you know, for a minute it did. For, for a moment it was impressive. For a, for a moment it maybe was distracting to my pursuits. For a moment maybe it was confusing to my call. For a moment maybe it was making me think that fame and fortune was what everything is all about. Maybe for a moment I took my eyes off of the glory and I was just looking at everything that the glory had produced. And these men in God's country, they had become more impressed by everything that was around him that they were no longer expecting. They were no longer looking to him. Because let's keep this in mind. Let's put this in context. In our, in our text, it says that Caesar Augustus was in power. Let's understand him fully. Julius Caesar was the ruler of Rome before Caesar Augustus. 40 years before Jesus was born, they would give Julius Caesar the name Julius the Divine. In other words, Julius the God. Julius would die. The Ides of March. Beware the Ides of March. And then in his will, he would heir his throne to his grand nephew, Octavius. Octavius then becomes ruler of Rome and he is given the name Caesar Augustus. And 27 years before Jesus was born, they give Caesar Augustus the title Divi Phileus, son of God. That's history. And Herod who was the ruler of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas who ruled that area under Julius Caesar and under Caesar Augustus because he had done so much for them politically. He built them their great temple, renovated it, made it so much bigger and more extravagant. He gave freedom to the Jews to worship in and out as they pleased. Because he had done so much for them at a political level, they called Herod king of the Jews. So here we have God and the son of God and the king of the Jews all in this ruling class. And the priest had become very comfortable with their power structure. They had become very comfortable with the systems. And instead of looking to God for their deliverance, they were looking to the systems for their deliverance. They were looking for the system to make them a promise. They were looking for the economics to give them prosperity. And they were no longer looking to heaven. It all glittered far more than the glory of God. Now, for us today, what is the prophecy? For us today, what is the expectation? Like, if the, everything around us isn't supposed to glitter more than the glory, what is the glory? What is our expectation? Like, let's forget for a minute just about some of the personal things that we know God has promised to us that we are standing for. What is the overarching promise, prophecy over the church that the church is supposed to be standing for? Regardless of everything else, what is our key expectation? What is the focus? What is the glory of God? In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17, it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, 
come. Let the one who hears say come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. For he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. And then the quotations end, and John, the best friend of Jesus, says, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. What, are, what is our expectation? Come, Lord Jesus. What is our prophecy? Come, Lord Jesus. What are we moving towards? Come, Lord Jesus. What are we looking for? Come, Lord Jesus. What dictates our lifestyle? Come, Lord Jesus. I don't ever want to be living in such a way that I'm not expecting him. I don't ever want to be talking in such a way that I'm not expecting him. I don't ever want my focus to be so distracted over here that I'm not expecting him, that I'm so happy in everything that he's given me that I'm no longer looking for him. What is my prophecy? Come, Lord Jesus. Why? Because he said, surely I am coming soon. And the church, the spirit and the bride have been saying this for 1,987 years and we'll say it every single day until the fulfillment of that promise and we'll look to the heavens until the fulfillment of that promise because when we take our eyes off the heavens we become satisfied with the earth and when he shows up we don't see him. Now, if you don't mind for a minute, though, let's just sort of delve into that Revelation passage because there's a whole lot there. The spirit and the bride say come. In other words, the message to the church is come. The message that we always should agree on, the message that should unite us, the message that is the one thing that we all say no matter what at any time is come. The spirit and the bride say come. So those who hear, let the one who hears that message say come. If you ever want to know what should be your confession, if you're a little bit confused about what might be something God is doing in the earth today, there's one thing that he's always doing. He's always coming. And he's always coming soon. And that must be principle in our confession that must be principle in the prophecy that we are desiring, expecting to be fulfilled. Everything else is secondary to that one. The spirit and the bride say, bride say come. So let the one who hears say come. And then I love this. It says, let the one who is thirsty come. Now, the one who's thirsty didn't say anything. The one who is thirsty did something. The one who is thirsty, it says, come. In other words, what James said was sort of exposed here. When James said, draw near to me and, and I'm going to draw near to you. So the one who hears, who's had ears to hear, what does he do? He says, come. But then what is the one who is thirsty? What do they do? They actually come. In other words, I have prayed for, I've prophesied, I've declared, but it's not just something to say. Now I'm moving on that. I'm stepping towards him because he has told me to declare that he's coming and he's asked me to come. Do we see that? It's not just asking God to do something and us doing nothing. And our doing something is the evidence of our thirst. When Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger, what? And thirst after righteousness. Why? Because they will be filled. What does hunger, what does thirst look like? It moves. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let them move towards me. And then he says something powerful. He says, let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Now, the water of life is not just another word for eternal life or another word for the tree of life. The water of life that we see explained a little earlier in Revelation 
is that river of living water that flows from the throne of God and the Lamb of God. If you grew up Catholic, you understand when you said, I believe in God the Father, I believe in God the Son, I believe in God the Holy Spirit. Why? Because that He proceeds from the Father and the Son. That's where that comes from. The water of life proceeds from the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. That Spirit of God is the water of life that flows from God's throne. But guess how it flows onto the earth? Jesus said, out of your belly will flow rivers verse what? Of living water. This is what he said about the Holy Spirit who had not yet been poured out. So when we see this living water that is without price, it says we are to desire that. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 and 14 said you should desire spiritual gifts. So I desire the movement or the activity of the Spirit of God and I receive it. It says take it. The gifts of the Spirit of God are to be received. But it seems like in order to receive them, we have to step away from some things. It says the one who's thirsty, come. So I have to let some stuff go in order to have margin in my life to receive. Because if I'm already full of the world, I don't have any room for the supernatural. So I have to step away from the carnality of the world so that I have space for the supernatural in my life. Jesus said it like this, when you have the bridegroom, when you have the thing that you want from God, when you have it, you're not fasting. Why? Because you're too busy rejoicing. You're too busy having a good time. You're too busy being excited about having the fulfillment of the promise that God made you. When I receive, that's where I celebrate. But in the absence of what I'm asking for, he says in that time, when you don't have the bridegroom, you need to fast. Fasting is simply stepping away from something that might be a distraction to receiving from God. Because there comes a point where man cannot live by bread alone, but can only live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so if I satisfy myself with everything that is carnal, I'm not even looking for what God will fill me with. I might say I desire him, but I'm not moving towards him. So it's just language that says come, but it's not thirst that's moving towards him. Now, I'm not talking about sin right now, because this is where a lot of us is like, we just got to quit sleeping with our girlfriend or our boyfriend, like straighten up, and then now I can. I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about carnality. That, that's not something that's wrong. It's just not best in your life right now because you need to quit focusing on everything that's on television or on your laptop or on your device and you need to just sort of fast from some things so that you can focus on Him. Anytime, anytime in my life where I'm not receiving from God that which I desire most, I can near always see where I have just become a little bit too satisfied with the fun that surrounds me. And, and you know, a lot of times it's nothing that's wrong. Like, there are times where your kids are just demanding. This one wants this, and this one wants to go here, and that one wants to go there, and that one needs this, and that one needs that. And it's not that it's wrong. But there are those times where we have to tell our kids, you know what, not today. That's not a no forever, it's just a no for now. Because daddy's got to take a couple of days to get into the presence of God and, and fast some things and push away from the table over here and pull myself up to God's table that I might receive what he has. And I have found that the older that I get, the harder it is to receive from God. And it's not because like I'm, I'm more in, inclined to be intuitive or academic or whatever. It's really more that I'm just so filled with everything else and I have so many other responsibilities and obligations that I'm constantly considerate of these things and I'm no longer seeking for the glitter of the glory of God. I've become satisfied that my kids hug me and love me. I become satisfied that my wife loves me and hugs me. 
I've become satisfied that if I want to go get a Coke, I've got enough to go spend $1.07 at McDonald's to get a Coke. I'm just satisfied. And so I'm no longer seeking the glory of God. And the glory of God will always come at a price, but it'll cost you nothing. Like, he, this isn't an offering pitch. He says, you're going to take of the Spirit without price. Whenever you find somebody that's making it sound like if you didn't get something from the Spirit of God, send them 500 bucks. You keep your $500 because there is a gift greater than what you can buy that comes without price. And it's about pushing away from the world. It's not about giving something. It's about getting away from something because God wants to give you something. And then that gift you receive. And sometimes people wonder, like, why are spirit-filled churches so... Why are they so animated? Like, doesn't that bother you? No, it doesn't bother me. It excites me. When I think about all Jesus went through in order to give us the Holy Spirit, like, when I receive that which he promised, it brings joy in my heart. Like, nobody... Do you ever, like, giving somebody something and they're like, eh, Thanks. No, it's the most obnoxious thing ever. Like, let's just put this in, in like really easy math terms. Let's just say you paid $80 for somebody for a gift. $80 sounds like a good gift to me. 80 bucks. There's people, wives right now, they're like, $80, don't you settle for that. <laughs> Stupid preacher, cheap, he's cheap. $80 is a pretty good gift. 80 bucks. Let's go 80 bucks. Think about what it takes to get $80. Like, if you make $10 an hour, you have to work eight hours. Not, not work eight hours. You have to do eight hours worth of work that they're paying you for. There's a whole bunch more that goes into that. Like, you just have to get up and get ready. You don't get paid for that. Then you have to get in your car and spend gas money and make a commute to get there. Let's say all that takes you 20 minutes. Maybe you can get ready fast. Maybe you live close. Now I've got eight hours and 20 minutes invested in this $80 gift. Eight hours and 20 minutes of my life. Well, then I've got 10 minutes to get back home. So now I'm at eight and a half hours. And then I realize in order to work eight hours to get paid for, they're going to make me take a break for 30 minutes, and they're going to pay me for the 30-minute break. Now I have nine hours in this whole thing in order to give you a gift. And if you're one of these people that likes it wrapped, now i got a whole lot more time. Because you go to wrap it, and you go to unroll it, and you, you know, the paper's this big, and you thought it was this big, because somebody used the majority of the paper, and then you can't find the tape, you can never find the tape, the kids got the scissors up in the room, so you got to go find that and chase that down, next thing you know, you're going to Walgreens to get some tape and another roll of paper, and you finally get back and get the thing wrapped up, and if I take my work time and my hassle, now I've got 10 or 11 hours in this gift. 10 or 11 hours of my life in this gift. And I bring it on Christmas. And they take it, and they open it, and they go, huh, thanks. Uh, thanks? Not... Hours of my life. What do I want to see? I want a Thanksgiving that is due my nine hours. So you think about that next time somebody wants to complain about the exuberance of the worship that they might see in church. Because you got to go back thousands of years to that moment where Adam sinned and God said, I'm going to make it right. And then leads us all the way to the law that leads us to Jesus. Thousands of years from the promise to get us to Jesus. Because, oh, I forgot to tell you that somewhere around here we got so sinful, God said, my spirit can't always strive with man so I'm going to have to remove him so the presence of God was removed from the earth and only at times would he come upon the priest or the king or the prophet and just in those moments the spirit of God would be poured out but then he'd go right back where he came from but no 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 let's just go thousands of years when Jesus came and removed sin and when sin was removed then God said oh hey proceeding from the throne of myself and my son I'm going to pour out the spirit of God on all all flesh and your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy and so all of a sudden I have the realization of that gift that I desire and so I just can't help but give him glory like I have to 
because I don't want Jesus on his throne to look at me and I go, eh. See, I worship with expectation. I glorify by faith. My satisfaction is not found in all that surrounds, but my contentment is only in Him. The priests weren't looking. The wise men were looking. Let me end with this. God has given his word into your hearts. God has prophesied to many of you. You have received somewhere in your life the promise of God that you haven't seen yet. And your faith is fading. The faith of the priests faded, but the wise men still expected. They kept the word. It's said that Herod, when he found out what was going on, that he gave the order for all the boys, two years and old younger, to be killed. He sought to snatch the word. Please understand it was the word that became flesh. When Joseph was warned in a dream to take Mary and Jesus to Egypt, he was telling him, go protect the word, for the enemy is coming to snatch the word to devour the word, to steal the word. But you have been given the command to hide his word. Psalm 119, 11, I have stored up your word in my heart. We have been given the command to store up, to hang on to the word. That promise that God has made you that you haven't seen just yet, you store that promise up in your heart. That promise that God has made you that you have not experienced yet in your life, you just continue to prophesy. You just continue to declare. Claire, because the one who gave you that promise is the one who is going to fulfill it. But if you let it go, if you forget about it, if you're not expecting it in your season, when God's moving, you'll miss the whole thing. But if you'll hang on to it, if you will protect it, if you will stir it up, I promise you that promise that God has made you, he will bring it to pass in its time. And so we thank him for his promise and we remind him of our expectation come Lord Jesus